Thank you. So, uh, my name is Björn Beskov. I come, I'm a consultant from uh, Kalista in Gothenburg. And uh, I'm here today to talk about multi-tenancy uh, uh, software as a service in um, multi-tenancy in particular. Uh, we'll talk about drivers. We talk about a number of uh, architectural challenges that needs to be addressed and we'll look at some concrete examples. So software as a service, as you all know, is a way of delivering and licensing software where you typically host the software uh, centrally and you typically license it through some kind of subscription model. So how many of you uh, use GitHub or Jira? Yeah, of course you do. Uh, so, uh, multi-tenancy uh, and software as a service has been uh, with us for quite a while. But as a consultant, um, we see a very strong drive among many of our smaller and mid-sized customers to also steer towards a software as a service delivery model. And the driver is, of course, primarily simplicity. Simplicity for the end user and that uh, the customers no longer need to maintain their own infrastructure servers, don't need to install uh, software and keep track of versions. But there's a great simplification for the um, uh, provider as well in terms of a simplified application life cycle in that you no longer have to deal with uh, supporting multiple uh, versions, legacy versions, no longer have to support customer specific configurations and uh, differences between customers that makes versioning, configuration management and testing complex. Uh, so software as a service promises uh, a simpler application lifecycle, which in the end might lead to better business agility. That is, you shorter lead time to provide um, value to the end customers. And of course, there is um, also the economic driver. Uh, for the end users, it means a substantially lower entrance fee, typically. Uh, often also provided as a freemium model, so that you can start out for free, and then you start paying as you go. Uh, and you gain that through cost efficiency, of course, in both hardware and software. And for the software vendor, uh, this is an extremely compelling business model. The promise of getting a steady stream of um, recurring revenue from the software instead of short bursts when selling licenses. There's an additional driver that the vendors perhaps doesn't talk that much of, and that is the possibility of data aggregation and business intelligence. Because if you sit on multiple customers' data in a uniform format, uh, the options of doing data mining and sophisticated business intelligence is, is endless, if the contract so allows. So that's also an important driver. Uh, there are different ways of building software as a service solutions. There's two principal uh, topologies, so to say. On the one hand, one extreme is to uh, deliver each tenant or customer in a completely separate stack. Uh, separate software and hardware for each customer. Now, uh, that seems expensive, but you still get some economy of scale in that uh, every customer instance will be identical. So uh, it will be probably be much cheaper to run it that way anyway. Uh, you probably also get uh, somewhat longer lead times to onboard new customers. Uh, so. Uh, we have worked with a couple of uh, customers in, in Gothenburg that has opted for this solution and they have struggled with getting uh, good economy in that solution. And also the lead time to onboard new customers have been uh, 
uh, an ongoing problem. Now, the other extreme is to instead use one big fat uh, logical installation and cram all the tenants into that single logical installation while still, and this is important, while still providing the illusion to every customer or tenant that they execute in a totally separated, isolated stack. And that's the tricky part. Now, the sweet spot is, of course, as always, somewhere in the middle where you share some parts and you use dedicated uh, resources for other parts, for instance, sharding in different regions. So we clearly deal with uh, uh, balancing of two conflicting requirements. On one hand, we'd like to reuse as much as possible, share as much as possible. But on the other hand, we really need to isolate the data of uh, our customers either logically or perhaps even physically. And important non-functional aspects that uh, highly impact this balancing act is, of course, the data separation requirements. How sensitive are your customer data? How eager are they to get really guaranteed that their data is kept completely private. And there's also often legal requirements in this area that you have to meet. Then the number of tenants, of course, will influence the solution as well. Do you have tens of tenants or hundreds or hundreds of thousands of tenants? And how frequent do you have to onboard new tenants and how long uh, should or how quick should such an onboarding be? And then there's also uh, the amount of customizability that you would like to provide uh, to your uh, customers that could influence this decision. So regardless of which way to choose, there is a number of uh, architectural uh, concerns that you need to address. And one of them is customizability. Because if we run every customer or tenant in the same logical software stack, then the only customizability that we can offer is the custom customizability that we have designed into the system. So we must prepare and design for extension points and customizability. And there are proven patterns for this, using tenant-specific configuration properties, uh, feature toggling based on uh, tenant preferences, and using templating techniques to allow tenants to customize the end user look and feel, branding, and so on. Uh, a slightly more advanced customization concept uh, to allow customizing the uh, business flows of the customer is to meta model the important um, business entities so that uh, customers can dynamically add their own attributes or properties to the core uh, concepts. Like you, for instance, can add properties to a JIRA issue or even additional states. Another important area that needs to be addressed is that of performance isolation between tenants. That is preventing a noisy neighbor for, from disturbing the business of other tenants. Now this is a particularly nasty problem to solve when you like to share as much as possible. Uh, I mean, edge server technologies like um, rate limiting, throttling, they only bring you that far. Um, and this is, as I said, a huge area. It would desire a whole, whole afternoon. And to my knowledge, there's no 
quick fixes for this problem. Uh, and if any one of you know of them, I'm really eager <laughs> to hear about them. So we won't talk more about performance isolation today, unfortunately. But the major area that needs to be addressed is that of uh, data isolation. Isolating uh, customer, cust tenant data from each other, logically or physically. Uh, here we have a number of well-proven design patterns, which we will dig into detail around. So the first option would be to not share any resources on the data layer at all. So that would be having a separate database per tenant, including a full copy of all the tables in the data model. So that will then be replicated uh, throughout all tenants, uh, which of course will give us a headache of keeping uh, that data model consistent. Uh, when it evolves, it needs to be um, fixed on each and every tenant database. And on the application layer, our uh, challenge would be to maintain multiple data sources to keep connections, database connections to the different databases and pick the right connection for the right tenant. Now this model is conceptually very simple and it indeed gives very strong data isolation guarantees from the database itself. It simplifies tenant specific uh, database management operations like tenant-specific backup policies. Uh, it perhaps allows some degree of performance isolation on the pure database layer. But it comes at a cost of uh, rather drastic overhead in resource requirements uh, on the database level, of course, but also in the application since we need to maintain those multiple connection pools to each and every database. And for a couple of thousand of databases, that will be a really, really scarce resource. Uh, and as we said, we need to take care of keeping the data model in sync uh, for all the customer tenants, even when it evolves over time. Uh, nowadays, uh, I guess everyone uses uh, some tool for that, usually called data migration tools like Liquibase or Flyway. How many of you use Liquibase or Flyway? Yeah, good. So uh, we need to make sure that those migrations happen on each and every database. So. In the end, this model perhaps scales to hundreds of tenants, probably not uh, much more before we hit uh, performance bottleneck. So option number two is a slight variation, schema per tenant. So in this pattern, we reuse the physical database, but instead utilize a database specific partitioning mechanism which in a relational database is usually called a schema. In a NoSQL database, usually referred to as collections, but the ID is the same. So here as well, we duplicate the data model in all schemas for all tenants. Uh, also conceptually simple, and we still get relatively strong data isolation guarantees by the and database provider itself. And we get the same benefits for uh, tenant-specific management. Uh, we still have an overhead in resource requirements, but it's much less than uh, using a database per tenant. Uh, in the application layer, we can typically reuse the same data sources and only make sure that uh, on the physical connections, uh, 
use the correct schema. We still have to handle the database migrations between schemas. So this scales to perhaps a couple of thousand tenants before the database probably starts to choke. So the third pattern is going all the way uh, for sharing. So in this pattern, we use a shared database, one single database, which means one single um, set of database tables in the data model. Instead, we enhance each and every table with an additional column, a discriminator column, so that every row in every table can be tied to a specific tenant. Uh, now, in this situation, the challenges on um, keeping databases in sync goes away, but instead we need to make sure that we utilize that tenant-specific discriminator column correctly, making sure that we always query for only the tenants that we are allowed to query from. So here we clearly have a minimal resource overhead. Uh, we no longer have to care about uh, uh, multiple database, multiple database schemas to keep in sync. So this guy scales to a very high number of tenants. Uh, also, there's no additional procedure involved in adding new tenants. But the flip side of it is that now we no longer have any guarantees uh, of data separation from the database vendor. So in using this scenario, it is up to us in the application layer to provide that data separation guarantee. And that might be a really tough challenge to be able to prove that there's no way that your data ever can be read by another tenant. Eventually, also, cramming all tenants into one single database, eventually that database will no longer fit the data. So in that situation, we need to use sharding technologies to split the database into uh, separate shards. And that point in time probably happens faster earlier if uh, going for the shared database pattern. Regardless of which pattern you choose, uh, you probably need to think carefully of, about how to implement the pattern uh, and modularize it, because otherwise it will probably affect a large part of the code base. And if we are going to give guarantees about um, data, privacy, it's really important to be able to pinpoint that part of the implementation. So that's usually called um, cross-cutting concern. So implementing uh, these patterns should be done uh, as implementing a cross-cutting concern. That is, modularize it and apply it without affecting the rest of the code base. So you will typically then need to handle tenant resolution, that is, um, resolve which tenant ID to use for a particular request and propagate that information to the part of the application stack that needs to use it, typically the persistence layer. And then depending on which pattern you go for, you might have to handle data source connection management or schema manipulation or query generation manipulation. So, let's dig into some concrete examples. Uh, I will exemplify this uh, on the Spring Boot with friends stack. Uh, even though the techniques demonstrated are not specific for Spring Boot, I will also uh, demonstrate it on relational databases, but the principles are the same for, for NoSQL databases as well. 
there's a lot of details uh, that can be found in a blog series uh, about multi-tenancy that is available on our blog and there's a github repository containing um, fully working implementations of all these patterns so please look into that for for details because the demo will be rather scratching on the surface so we start with the database per tenant pattern uh, in order to be able to onboard new tenants we probably want to optimize uh, the creation of uh, tenant databases and we also need to keep track of the mapping between the tenant and the database for that tenant so for that we'll use a master database and um, tenant management application to be able to onboard tenants. Uh, in the service, we need to uh, do the uh, resolving of uh, tenant IDs, propagating it to the repository layer where we will manage a data source or a connection factory per tenant since we're targeting different databases. Cache that and select the correct data source or connection factory per tenant. So, we like to build this in a modular fashion with minimal impact on the application. Uh, so, uh, in this example, I've placed it in a package in real life you typically would package it as a utility jar or even a spring boot starter uh, but the idea is that we keep the uh, business entities uh, fully unaware so from entity to controller layer to migrations liquid base migrations standard without any uh, coloring of the multi-tenancy solution uh, moving on to the management application, in order to keep track of tenants, we need to uh, map tenant IDs to the databases for that specific tenant and the credentials to use the database. And we'll have a REST controller to onboard new tenants uh, from outside and we implement that uh, simplistically by just for a new tenant create a new database for that tenant using the credentials provided and then run liquibase to bootstrap uh, that new database uh, right so moving over to the liquibase change set it will be the same as we saw previously same change set right so in the service then starting with the uh, resolution of uh, tenant ID uh, we look at the tenant repository uh, in order to run liquibase migrations on all uh, databases we also have to provide that whenever the data model changes resolving tenant id then in the spring mvc uh, model we do that using an uh, interceptor and in this simplistic example we pick up the tenant id from uh, an http header uh, that would typically be set by um, uh, by an ingress server and we pass it along to the persistence layer using a tenant context mechanism and also in a synchronous environment that would typically be implemented using a thread local mechanism. So we use a thread local variable to be able to tie the 
tenant ID to the current thread, and then it can be picked up uh, by the persistence layer. Standard uh, mechanism in a synchronous stack. Uh, in a reactive stack in Spring Web Flux, uh, it looks very much the same. So we use the resolver using a web filter, picking out the tenant ID from the HTTP header, whereas the tenant context mechanism will be implemented using a uh, reactive context, allowing us to attach the tenant ID to the uh, reactive context and it will be propagated down the reactive chain so that the persistence layer may be able to pick it up. Moving over to selecting um, data source then. In a JPA setting using Hibernate, we have a um, Hibernate abstraction for this. So Hibernate provides a tenant identifier resolver abstraction where we can plug in our mechanism to retrieve the tenant from the tenant context. And correspondingly, there's a data source factory abstraction. So where we provide the data source connection for the specific tenant. So here we can select the data source that belongs to that tenant. And we do that by keeping a mapping, a cached mapping between tenant ID and data source. So there's the mapping. Uh, and by making that uh, loading cache, we can um, instantiate it lazily so that we can uh, uh, add on new uh, data sources dynamically and also close them if not used. Uh, in a reactive setting using Spring R2DBC, it looks very similar as well. So here we use a tenant aware routing connection factory that allows us to uh, provide a, a lookup key for uh, the current tenant, uh, returning the tenant ID from the tenant context, and a corresponding connection factory lookup, allowing us to look up the uh, connection factory for that specific tenant. And again, using a loading cache mapping tenant ID to connection factory for that tenant and being able to uh, load new connection factories on demand. So that was a complex but still modularized implementation. So let's test drive it. We start a Postgres database for the master data we start the master manager application and let's add one tenant and let's add another tenant. And we'll have a look in the database connecting to Postgres. So here's the master database and we're keeping track of the mapping so that we can map tenant IDs to the corresponding databases. And we can see the two tenant databases have been created. So let's also start the service and add some uh, data. So we start the service and we can see that the migrations indeed run on those two data sources again. So let's add two products. Let's add product one to tenant number one. Let's add another product two to this first tenant. And let's add a third product to tenant number two. 
and we head over to the database and we can see that for tenant number one those two products lay there in the tenant specific database and if we query for them using the service layer we query for the products for tenant one we get the two products and for tenant two we get product number three so uh, this implementation does work but it was rather complex schema per tenant example number two uh, is simpler we still need to handle the database migrations but the data source management is no longer necessary so now we only need to decorate the connections with the correct schema usage so we'll switch over to that implementation uh, and we'll have a look at the management service so we still need to onboard tenants by actually creating the schemas and running the liquid base migration to bootstrap uh, the tenant data model but the data source handling will now be much simplified so again using jpa we have an hibernate abstraction the connection provider that takes a data source and retrieves a specific connection for that data source so we can reuse the data source but retrieve a connection after having decorated it with the correct schema information and the implementation is very much the same in uh, r2dbc so we have a connection factory interface to implement and we do exactly the same so when creating a connection from a connection factory we pick out the tenant ID and then we decorate the connection with that schema information setting the schema so this is a much more compact uh, implementation and we still of course then need to handle the liquid base configuration so we still need to configure liquid base to run on all schemas uh, given the master data repository that holds the information about this, which schemas exist for which tenants so that was a simpler implementation but the major obstacle is maintaining those migrations now in this simple implementation they are executed sequentially and obviously if you have thousands of tenants to run migrations on you cannot do that in sequence you have to parallelize the work and probably it will take too long time to do it on application startup anyway so you would probably need to break that uh, functionality out of your application and run the migrations separately moving on to the third implementation uh, shared database uh, so now we only have one data um, model to care about so we no longer have to treat liquid based migrations specifically but instead we must be very very sure that for every query that we issue that we always include an additional where condition and for every mutation make sure that we actually provide the correct tenant id and that is something that you don't want to do in all your repository implementations you really want a mechanism to apply 
to an otherwise unaffected application. So we start out with a Hibernate-based uh, implementation. Uh, Hibernate-specific, uh, where Hibernate provides a filtering mechanism. So we start by observing that with uh, shared database, the um, business entities will no longer be fully unaffected. So in this case, we do need to uh, extend from a tenant aware base entity where we add that tenant ID column. Then we need to make sure that the tenant ID is properly set on every mutation. So for that we can use a JPA feature known as Entity Listener that will execute uh, whenever an entity is updated. And for filtering, here's the Hibernate specific mechanism. We can use a filter where we uh, specify the where condition that should be applied. Now, unfortunately, that's not enough. We also need a mechanism to apply that filter every time that is needed. So for that, we typically need our custom aspect because here this functionality is not complete in Hibernate. So this is not an implementation that uh, I would really rely on. I wouldn't sleep well at night. Uh, luckily, there are other ways of achieving a guarantee that the filtering actually happens, and that is by utilizing uh, a security feature that most modern databases provide today, and that is role level security, a feature that is available in all major databases uh, except MySQL, unfortunately. Uh, so, the idea is that the database guarantees that access to a, any row in the database is subject to uh, a declarative um, constraint. So, let's look at that implementation. Uh, so, being a uh, database feature, we have to apply it as a DML statement. So we'll add it to our Liquibase change set. Uh, and the syntax will be vendor specific. So this is Postgres. So in Postgres, it looks like this. On the product table, we apply a policy saying that any modifications, any access, read, writes, updates to um, any row in this table need to fulfill this. Um, condition that the tenant ID must match a um, session specific variable named uh, tenant ID in this example. So our job now is only to make sure that that session variable is being set correctly. And that is much easier. So here we again can use uh, the data source, the delegating data source to uh, decorate connection um, creation by setting the tenant ID session variable from the tenant context. And in R2DBC, it looks very much the same. Uh, yeah, the entity listener mechanism we will still have to use just as before, but that's works exactly the same. So the R2DBC implementation, uh, we already have seen this interface. So it's the connection factory interface that we implement uh, by on any creation of a connection from a connection factory. We pick out the tenant ID and then we set the session variable uh, to the tenant ID. And then the Postgres will do all the heavy lifting. Uh, the entity listener correspondence in uh, R2DBC is called entity callbacks. So it works the same. So let's test drive this quickly as well. So 
we'll start up Postgres once again. Now we don't need any management application, so we can start the service and add those products once more. So adding product number one, product number two for tenant one, and product number three for tenant number two. Heading over to the database, we can see that in this shared database, in the product table, uh, the products lie side by side, but, but uh, indexed by the tenant ID. Uh, but if we access them through the service layer, we get them filtered out because the service layer is subject to this uh, row level security constraint. So this was a much cleaner implementation. So that's the shared database pattern. Now, of course, uh, one pattern doesn't fit all situations. And obviously, these patterns can and should be combined. So for instance, the database per tenant pattern could be easily modified into a database per set of customers or shard uh, where we use a shared database inside those shards uh, combining the shared database with the uh, data source and database per tenant and the same um, can be done using the schema per tenant and the database per tenant keeping a small number of databases uh, and inside each database host a larger number of schemas uh, and thereby uh, gaining the best parts of uh, all these patterns. So let's look at a quick example of this as well. So we'll check out an implementation of a sharded uh, solution uh, using a shared database among a set of shards. So the metadata that we need to keep track of now is shards, their IDs and which database they live in, credentials, and also perhaps the number of tenants they can host. And for each tenant, we need to map the tenant to a shard. So that's the metadata. And in the management application, onboarding new tenants will mean we'll allocate them to shards. So in this simplistic example, let's just pick any shard that has available capacity. And if there are no such shards, then open up a new shard, create a new database, uh, set up uh, uh, the data structure. Uh, so let's start the management application once more and let's add a couple of shards. Now I have configured the number of shards, uh, the number of tenants per shard to be maximum two. So here we got one new shard created for the tenant. We created tenant number two and it will be allocated to that same shard. Now that shard is full, so if we allocate a third tenant, it will be placed in a new shard. So that way uh, you get the best of the two patterns. And implementation-wise, this is of course just combining the implementations. So the connection factory lookup just uh, as before, but now we map tenant IDs to tenants and then map tenants to the shard where they live to get the connection factory for that shard just as before. Uh, and for the management inside uh, each shard we use the connection factory just as before uh, utilizing the Postgres role level security to discriminate between the tenants inside that same shard. Right. So, 
summing up, multi-tenancy is indeed a very cost-efficient way of building software as a service solutions. But there are a couple of architectural challenges that need rather careful consideration. So uh, they should be thought through up front. And one of the biggest challenges lies precisely in what we have been concentrating on. That is the data isolation between tenants. And as often, there's no one size fits all. Uh, so these patterns have uh, different trade-offs. And as you know, requirements are uh, usually not stable over time. So the last uh, assignment I worked with, we started out with uh, schema per tenant implementation. And after a year, we had to move over to a shared database instead because of scalability issues. Now we had made our lesson and made the implementation uh, highly modularized. So that switch from schema per tenant to um, shared database was not a big issue. So the takeaways. Database per tenant or schema per tenant. Uh, they give you very strong data separation guarantees. So they are probably the default choices if the data separation is top priority and if the number of tenant is fairly modest. But do indeed pay enough attention to the data migration issues. Make sure that you get a mechanism for applying uh, the database migrations in place from day one, because otherwise it will be painful. Uh, and the shared database with discriminator is probably the most suitable for high uh, volume um, solutions where you have a large number of tenants or where the tenant onboarding needs to be really quick and they can indeed be combined. And do pay attention to encapsulating the implementation properly. Uh, so that it doesn't affect the rest of the application. And with that, I think I'm done. And we have time for a few questions. Two questions. Yeah. What's the most, the most promising? I hate to give that answer, but I must say it depends. Uh, there is no, no correct answer and it will probably differ over time. So it's good to have all those patterns in your toolbox and choose the correct one in the correct situation. Yes, please. Yeah, data on which are the most popular. Um, clearly, the database per tenant uh, is the one that is mostly used uh, for um, larger uh, companies, whereas startups uh, typically go for the uh, shared database. Yes. Yes, um, I've seen uh, for in the example of Oracle, they have this uh, a PDB pluggable database model that is like a container, a big database, and then you have container databases inside, which sounds like um, suitable for 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 multi tenancy. Would it be? Would it be the schema per tenant pattern that you show, more or less, or with this uh, 
pluggable database, which pattern would follow in this case, considering uh, all the alternatives you show? Yes. Uh, I don't know that uh, technology well enough to answer that question, but it sounds to me that uh, it's a technology that would make uh, hosting uh, multiple databases cheaply. Uh, and in that case, uh, you would lessen the resource requirement on the database side for the database per tenant pattern. You would still have the same problem uh, on the application side, keeping track of uh, lots of database connections to different databases. Yes. Last question. I'm wondering uh, how do the different uh, models actually improve uh, the overflow of data from happening or how do they, I mean, there is still the tenant ID which is provided in the header and based on that tenant ID, it's, well, depending on how the implementation is, uh, that might be spoofed and thus gaining or, uh, access to other tenants' data, uh, regardless uh, if it's uh, yep. in a separate uh, database. Good question. So uh, implementing the tenant resolution strategy that way in the service layer, of course, relies on some other mechanism on the edge. So you typically use some kind of edge server or ingress server to determine that tenant ID in a proper and secure way uh, using uh, perhaps uh, the domain address or picking it out from uh, a security token. And only on the inside uh, the tenant ID has been propagated through a, a, a header. Uh, good question, thank you. Okay, I think we've run out of time. Uh, please grab me uh, at the coffee break if you have more questions. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Bjorn. And uh, don't forget to evaluate. And it's Fika time now.